Hello, welcome to Ignite Your Personal Brand Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Darlene Holly, and I'm so excited to kick off 2019 with these powerful stories and trainings to help you create an authentic, magnetizing, and profitable brand and business. In this series, I'll be interviewing amazing women who will be sharing their story for why they started their journey into entrepreneurship, and they're sharing their top tips to make an impact on your bottom line to create a thriving business in 2019. And I am so excited for today's guest. Please help me welcome Tara Bradford. Hi, Tara. Hi. Hi, Darlene. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for being on. I'm so excited to have you. And I know you're going to be sharing so many amazing tips for us for how to get PR for our business and kind of help self-promote ourselves so we can get our name out into the market space. But before we dive into that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you, Tara. How did, who are you? What got you onto this path to become an entrepreneur? Absolutely. I'm Tara Bradford, as you mentioned, and I'm a publicity strategist, reputation designer, international speaker, CEO and founder of Ray Media Group, and I actually started my career as a critical care nurse. I spent a decade in healthcare working as a nurse, and through that experience, I realized that I wanted to do something different. I didn't even know entrepreneurship existed until I moved to New York City and I met my first mentor and I was still working as a nurse. And at, through those conversations I had with my mentor, he was like, you should really start a business. You sound really entrepreneurial. You have lots of great ideas. You're a problem solver. And so through those conversations that we were having, I decided to start my first business which was a high-performance coaching practice here in New York City. And as I started my business, I ended up getting a lot of press for myself. I started my business in October, and by December, I had my first clients, and I also got an introduction to the executive producer of The Dr. Oz Show. And I wasn't quite sure what, I, what business I had on the Dr. Oz show or what I was going to talk about or why that was even happening or how it could help my business. It just sort of happened. And I ended up not being on the show. But from that point forward, I was determined to figure out what PR was all about, how I could get more of it, and what the point was for my business development and business growth. And after that, I became a regular contributor for Huffington Post. I was a con contributor for Thrive Global. I was featured in Glamour Magazine and Cosmopolitan. And journalists were asking me if I was part of the industry. They said, the way that you write sounds like you're one of us. And nobody had ever told me that before. And then I was on multiple podcasts throughout the course of a year. And I ended up being featured in the media every two weeks for those 12 months. And at the end of that, not only was I being invited to speak at events and to co-author books and write chapters for books, I was also being asked if I would do PR for people who ran businesses similar to mine. And at first I said no. I was like, I'm not a publicist. I've never worked in an agency before. I don't know what I'm doing. And then I was invited to guest lecture in the communications department at a university in New York City for their bachelor's and master's programs. And that was when I really decided and realized that I had taught myself how to do this and I was already doing it for myself and started teaching other people how to do it in my program, Imposter to Influencer, and then launched my PR agency so that I could help other leaders who either are running businesses or who wanna be the face of their business become those thought leaders and share their stories in the media as well. That's amazing. So a lot of your journey then into um, teaching about PR and how to get your name out there was self-taught. You started that process on your own and just found that it was working and connecting, which is amazing because I know a lot of times it takes years for people to figure out how to do that. And you did it so quickly. What do yeah. you think was your like secret sauce to that? Like, what do you think was like the one thing that really clicked for you for getting your name out there? I think it was building relationships and connecting with people and networking. I ended up networking a lot in New York City because I didn't know anybody when I moved there. 
And through that networking, I met lots of different kinds of people. And so that's probably what, what started it was that building relationships just came naturally to me and communication and getting to know people and seeing their strengths and inviting them to talk about them, being curious about who they are and what they do, what their work day looks like. And part of that came from me wanting to reinvent my career, to change career paths and industries. So the curiosity was genuine and, and just came natural. So I know a lot of um, my clients and even myself sometimes too, like I'm a little nervous to put myself out there to be featured or to get the, the marketing and the attention that I need. It's a little nerve wracking at points. And I know that a lot of people that I talk to just aren't sure how to even do it. So what do you think are the biggest reasons that hold us back? And what are some ways that we can kind of start getting ourselves into a place to where we feel comfortable having ourselves in magazines or in articles or on podcasts or all those amazing places that we need to be so we can get our name out there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And I have to preface my answer by saying I was not always comfortable speaking in front of people. In fact, I used to be, I was super shy as a kid and I, in high school and college, we had to give presentations. I was always the person reading from the paper, not making eye contact, turning bright red, breaking out in hives, wishing it would end and wondering why do we have to do this part of school? Like I hate it. And even as a nurse, I had to present information about my patient in front of five doctors every morning. And I I would still turn red and I still felt uncomfortable talking about it because I was thinking, what if I say something stupid? What is everyone going to think if I sound really dumb? And what if I don't sound like I know what I'm talking about? And so I would always let someone else be the person to share the information. And in my mind, I would be thinking, that's exactly what I was going to say. I should have just said it, but I didn't. And and public speaking was never on my bucket list of things that I wanted to do. And now I speak quite often. And so I would say if any of these things are holding you back, like I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't like talking in front of people. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or what if I say something stupid? Any of those fears that come up, fear of judgment, rejection, um, even fear of people being trolls on the internet and disagreeing with you. The way to overcome that is by taking action because those fears make us want to isolate ourselves. They make us want to hide. They create that little voice in our head that says we're not ready for PR and the timing's off and we need to make a little bit more money or have a more interesting story or work with more clients or get more experience or go get a degree in the thing that we want to do before we take that leap. And what you really need to do is take action. And I did not go from coaching people in October to feeling confident being on the Dr. Oz show in two months. This was something that happened over a period of time. And one of the things that I decided to do was to spend the 12 months before I started my business overcoming fears. So I made a list of everything I was afraid of. I was afraid of heights. I was afraid of public speaking. And I just did those things. I was afraid of eating dinner by myself in a restaurant and asking for a table for one. Things like that, that I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be judged for this. I just went and did it and prove to myself that nothing bad was going to happen to me if I just did it. And with the public speaking, I ended up taking a job as a nurse in the operations and regulatory department of the hospital and teaching a class on neurology, a four-hour class, once a month for 18 months, the 18 months that I worked there. And I started out just teaching the first two hours of the class. And then eventually I was teaching the full four hours 
and someone else created the slides. So I, it eliminated that fear of what if I sound dumb because the slides were someone else's information and it was very based in science. So it was hard to mess up. Yeah. So I practiced presenting by the time that I got to the point, I think it was six months in, I ended up teaching the whole class by myself. And at the end, people in the audience clapped. They applauded for, in a class about neurology and stroke. <laughs> and I was shocked. I was like, is this normal? Are they just being nice? What's going on? And I went to my boss and I said, you usually finish out the class for me. And I start it. Do people always clap at the end? And she said, no, no one's ever clapped for me at the end. And that was when I realized I was doing it. It's like riding a bike for the first time without training wheels. And you realize you're not falling over and you're doing it and it's happening. And so at that point, I had proven to myself that I could do this and that the information was being received in a really positive way. And then from a PR standpoint, I had, I just started signing up for podcast interviews for new podcasts and, and writing articles and just going through the process of doing it and learning by falling down and getting back up. So I did have a podcast interview early on that I did not think went very well. And the questions that the person asked me, I felt like I was in a therapy session and I was sharing some of the most vulnerable parts of my life for the first time ever. And it was being recorded and knowing that you can ask someone to, to not publish something. And how do you ask someone not to share that part, even though you agreed to it, but you changed your mind. So you are allowed to do that and giving yourself permission to do that. The other one was I wrote an article about Me Too, and I included some information about the stages of grief from my medical background, and that article wasn't well received by everyone. And knowing how to respond to people when they disagree with you, and really understanding the parts of what you're writing that might trigger someone, and how to hold space for them, and really be open to hearing them because I think that's what a lot of people, I think that's what we all want is to be heard and seen for who we are as our most authentic selves and for everything that we've been through and just recognized for those things. Yeah. And that's so good. And I love that you shared so much of like the backstory to it because there was, there are times when you're going to maybe share something that's raw and emotional and deeper then maybe you want to and knowing it's okay, you can delete it or not publish it or know that you're going to have different reactions and responses too. Because as an entrepreneur, as we're sharing ourself and kind of all of ourself, because especially in this day and age, there's so much social media, there's so many different ways you can share. And sometimes it's a hard line to cross whether you, is this too much? Does my audience need to hear this? Or maybe this is a great thing. Maybe I do need to share this because this is going <clears> to <throat> help them connect at a totally different level than we've ever connected before. But it's a hard balance line. I know I find that for myself. Like sometimes you're like, oh, that was scary. <laughs> I just shared something that was, you know, that I've never even shared maybe with friends or with family, especially when you're on a podcast. They, you can be asked random questions that you're not expecting or they ask one more question that just takes you to a whole new level. So I love that you share that it's okay to go back sometimes and say, nope, that was a little too much. That was out of my comfort zone. And then other times you're being pushed forward. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So how do you get recognized as an expert? I know there's a lot of different ways that you can get your name out there. What are some of the best ways that you can start to be recognized as an expert and not feel like you're an imposter? <laughs> <laughs> One of the best things you can do is to take action towards the things that you want to be doing. So if you want to get featured in the media, start guest blogging, start writing articles that can be published on other platforms and putting your message out there into the internet, into the world so that other people can read it is one of the best things you can do for your business to generate leads, to grow your email list, 
because you're tapping into audiences that already exist. And that's going to drive more traffic to your website faster than you could organically just using social media or Instagram stories or Facebook live videos because your reach is only so far and they're constantly changing the algorithm, changing how many people you can reach. And so by tapping into these audiences that have already been built, you are skipping some steps, but you're still attracting leads organically, which I think is a really important point to make that you should grow your audience organically first before you start paying for advertising. Otherwise, you're wasting your money because if you pay for advertising too soon and you haven't built an audience, then your targeting is going to be off. You're going to be attracting the wrong people and you're not going to be seeing the results that you want to be seeing. Yeah, and that, that makes sense because you, don't, you want to be able to draw people in and connect with them before you're paying for that. Make sure it's working, kind of get that proven system <laughs> that's working for you. Right. So, and with, sorry, with the media, you have warm leads and hot leads from being vetted by those media outlets or being vetted by those other influencers who have big blogs that are letting you write for them. The people following them already know them, like them, and trust them. And so when they say, let me introduce you to my friend Tara, similar to how you are doing here with the summit, you're introducing your audience and and the rest of us are introducing our audiences to the people in the summit to say, I trust this person and they have something interesting to say, something valuable to say, and I want you to know who they are. Yeah. And that no like trust factor is so important, especially as you're going out and just sharing who you are. When you have an audience that's already welcoming and warm, it's so much easier just to be yourself and connect and start to grow in that organic way as well. They can really, they already feel like they know you because they already know, like people know me so that they're automatically going to want to hear what you have to say because they trust that I wouldn't put somebody in, in, in front of my audience or in front of my friends who wouldn't give great value or share amazing things. Right. So, ha so once you get those guest posts and you get podcasts and you're starting to get some traction and get out there into the market space. Um, how do you connect that to your audience to where you're able to get people to say, look, I was featured here or I, I'm on this podcast. How do you use that information to really grow your audience in another, like even more organically? Like, how do you use that to say, you know where I'm going with this? How do we use that? Yes, <laughs> yes. you absolutely have to use it. I talk to so many people who say, I was featured in Forbes and nothing happened, or I was featured in HuffPost and then nothing happened and I still feel the same. My bank account still has the same amount of money in it. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be getting from this. And so you really need a strategy around your publicity. And some of the things that you can get out of it are growing your email list, driving more traffic to your website, driving more traffic to your lead magnet, but sometimes it is just brand awareness. And no matter what you're doing, it's way more than just logos on your website. And so a lot of people come to me and they're like, I need the logos on my website so that people will trust me and they'll hire me. And I'm thinking, well, how many people are actually visiting your website each month or each week? And is it really significant enough that they're gonna care if those logos are there or not? And the truth is, if you're a small business owner or a personal brand or a coach or consultant, all of the traffic that goes to your website, you are driving it there. And people are not just Googling you and going to page 13 to find you. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was that easy, right? <laughs> I know. It's not, it's not happening that way. And so no matter what's on your website, it doesn't matter how brilliant it is. If no one's going there then they're not seeing it. And so the, the self-promotion piece is huge. You need to be sharing your articles that you get featured in on your social media feed, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest even, in your Instagram story, and writing about it and repurposing that content so that it amplifies it, so it reaches more people. 
because not only are you accessing the existing audience of that publication, you're also using it to build credibility and social proof with your existing audience. And that's, I think, something that a lot of people skip over because they think, oh, my email list only has 100 people, or my social media following on Instagram is less than 1,000, or whatever it is that has you thinking, like, I'm not big enough. My reach is not far enough yet. But if you reframe that and think, if I had those 100 people on my email list in my living room right now, that would feel like a, a whole lot of people. And realistically, can I even work with 100 people in a year? I can't. No, that would be exhausting. <laughs> that, would be a, that would be too much. So having a small list or having a small following of super engaged followers who have been following you for a while, who love everything that you write, letting them know, hey, I got featured in Forbes, it adds another layer of, it could push them over from liking you to trusting you. Because now they're like, oh, Forbes trusts her enough to write about what she has to say. Maybe I should pay closer attention to what she's doing. And maybe I should hire her. It really takes you to the next level. And the key there is for you to start seeing yourself the way that other people are seeing you, even though you feel the same. You're like, I got featured in Forbes and nothing happened and I feel the same, but other people are seeing you differently. And if you don't catch up internally with how your external environment is evolving, you're going to miss those opportunities. I love that because I think a lot of times we – are nervous what people are going to think from the video or from the interview or from listening to it. And you don't really have to think about what they're hearing. Like you're just getting that credibility. They're starting to connect and get to know who you are and you're not really needing to hide from it. Cause I think a lot of times we're like, we're afraid to hit the submit button and tell, you know, our family and friends that we were featured somewhere because what are they going to think? Or are they going to judge us? Like you said, we don't, we, we always put those what ifs in our head, but we don't need to because it's, it's, giving that credibility to ourselves and people are really going to start to see us as the expert that we are and it's going to grow from there. So you don't have to hide behind it and be fearful or worried about what people might think about it. Absolutely. One of the things I, sorry, one of the things I hear all the time with podcasts is people say, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I hate <laughs> hearing my voice on recordings or voicemails and getting over that and realizing that it's not about the voice. It's not about the video. It's not about what you're wearing. It's about your message. That's what people remember. And they remember how your message made them feel. Yes. And you have every, each of us has a different story and a different place that we're coming from in our lives. So we're going to see things through different lenses. We're going to see things in a totally different way. Even if two people experience the exact same thing together, you're going to have different sides of the story. We're all going to be at different points in our life. So I think it's kind of cool to be able to look at people that we know and people that we respect to look up to and see how they see things and how they're playing that to be a part of their social media strategy or how they're using that as their PR for getting their name out there. Yeah, that's such an interesting point that you just made that two people can have the exact same experience and walk away with a different story and I realized this for the first time. I was going to a Broadway show in New York City. I was, went and saw Kinky Boots. And oh. I love musicals. <laughs> and I was on the subway after leaving. And someone on the train had been at the musical as well. And they were talking about it. And I said, oh, my gosh, I was just there too. And they said, yeah, we loved it. It was such a great story about a boy and taking over his father's business and selling shoes. And I was thinking the story was so much deeper than selling shoes. It was, out of, it was about a boy who was being his authentic self and showing up proud of himself and like really stepping into his power and, and becoming the man that he always wanted to be. And like, I just felt so much more connected to the message than they did. And we walked away with two different impressions and we both liked it, but we both retell the story in a different way. And so psychologically, we are putting ourselves into every story that we hear, 
every story that we see and looking at it through the lens of our own experiences in our own lives. Yeah. No, and each of us has, we're going to see it differently. So it's, and it's kind of a beautiful thing though, because you'll look at somebody else and you're like, oh, you totally missed like all these different pieces, but they weren't ready to see that yet. Maybe the next time they see it, they might look at it through a different lens or see it in a different light. But I think we take in those experiences too, for where we're at currently and kind of what the place that we're at in our lives. So, but it's fun to see sometimes like the different things that we can take in and how we can experience it in totally different ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as we start to kind of wrap things up, if, if somebody's a little bit nervous about putting themselves out there, what are kind of some top ways that you think that, what are the baby steps? Like if, if somebody just wants to start trying to get um, pitched on a podcast or to do those things, if you had kind of a couple tips for somebody who is newer in marketing themselves in that way, what would you suggest to do? I think your first time on a podcast, you should ask what the questions are going to be ahead of time or write down the questions that you feel comfortable answering and ask the host if it would be helpful for them if you sent the questions ahead of time to them to make sure it was appropriate for their audience. And honestly, I think most podcast hosts would be grateful to have that information ahead of time because it saves them some time doing research on you and your topic and trying to come up with those questions themselves. It also puts the power in your hands for where the interview is going to go and where you feel comfortable having it go so that it showcases your strengths and the things that you feel confident talking about. If you already have a list of those questions that you know the answer to off the top of your head. You don't have to practice. You don't have to research. You don't have to look anything up. You can just talk about it. And then the other thing I would say for podcasts, when you are being interviewed, try to tell stories. And that way you don't have to get caught up in the technical details of things or statistics or knowing the right numbers or anything like that when you are just having a conversation. A lot of times people will learn things through stories that are greater and more valuable than anything that you could have listed out as a fact or a bullet point or a statistic. Yes. And storytelling is, I think, in every piece of communication that we're using as a business owner, whether it's in a blog post or it's on a podcast or if it's in just a social media post or even your day-to-day -day conversation, like people are going to relate to you more when you're just sharing about who you are and experiences that you've had, that's going to give you the expert label just because you're, you've lived life, you've lived experiences, you have things that you can teach and only you can teach it the way that you do. So storytelling, I think is vital as part of any process that we're sharing who we are with our audience. For sure. And definitely podcasts and guest blog posts are the lowest barrier to entry. So it would be the easiest for you to get featured in those places first. And TV is the hardest. So I would strategize that way. Start with podcasts, guest blogs, then go to digital and print publications, and then go to local TV and then national TV. Okay. And th this is coming from you who was on almost on Dr. Oz, what, two months into it too. So <laughs> I did it backwards. You I did it backwards. <laughs> yeah. I reverse engineer everything. Don't follow my lead. <laughs> no, but, and that's, it's, it's great to just to start putting ourselves out there. How often do you recommend like people pitch themselves to podcasts? Like, is there a statistic? Is it you might get picked up one out of 10 pitches or does it kind of just vary depending on the industry and who you're reaching out to? Or is there any number games when it comes to it? It depends how good you are at pitching yourself. Okay. <laughs> I actually have a group program where I teach people how to pitch the media and I have an 80 to 90% success rate with pitching, but it really starts with building the relationship. And I would encourage people to build those relationships rather than trying to cold pitch and playing the numbers game. I think it's more valuable to build a few relationships with people whose publication is targeting the same audience that you want to target and then be featured over and over again as their guest expert in your expertise 
rather than trying to get featured in 200 different places and reinventing the wheel every time. And I love that because just the relationship building and connecting is going to grow. It's going to have that snowball effect because once you get to know that one person, they might have connections. They have other people they can um, connect you with. So I definitely agree, like building relationships and really building something where you can snowball and grow from there is so much better than trying to hit every single person you know, or you can find when you do a Google search for podcasts because you want to make sure that you're building the right relationships and that you're also going back and making sure it's the right place where your audience is going to be. Cause you could pitch yourself to hundreds of podcasts, but if your audience isn't listening to those podcasts, it's not necessarily going to do anything to grow your business and grow those connections as well. Right. Right. And then it feels like a waste of time and it feels like it's not working. I will say after being featured over 20 times in a year, that was the tipping point for when I started being invited to speak and invited to be on expert panels and all of those other opportunities that came my way happened after being featured like about around the 20 mark. Good to know. That'll help a lot of us as we're looking at our, um, the different podcasts and different interviews that we've been on, we're able to go, Oh, look at how much credibility I've just built. And I think it gives you that confidence too. Like I know every time I get featured, um, on a um, blog or something like that. It's, it gives that internal confidence that there's one more place that I put my name out there. I've shared my story one more time. So just keep doing it and keep putting the effort into it. And, you know, my goal is to at least be featured one time per month is what I've been kind of using for the past year. And I'm slowly starting to get that traction. So it's nice to be able to go, okay, I've been seen a couple of places. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's kind of fun when you get those videos back and you're like, oh, I was featured. I have something, you know, new material to share. And it's not something that you had to create. Like, and you can repurpose it in so many different ways. So if you're not using the strategy, I definitely think after talking to Tara, you definitely need to start going out there and pitching yourself to um, the different platforms so that you can grow your audience and really um, grow into who you are and not be afraid to show your authentic self, be a little bit vulnerable, have a little fun with the media. So I know you have a free gift for us, Tara. Can you tell us a little bit about what those of us that have participated in the summit are able to get from you? Yes, I have a PR checklist on my website, five things that you can do to upgrade your online credibility right now. And I have a five video training series that goes along with it to explain each of the five points on the checklist. So you can head on over to my website. I'm sure Darlene will put the link in the comments, but it is tararaybradford.com slash PR hyphen checklist. And you'll be able to download that checklist today. Awesome. And I have seen this checklist and it's gold. So definitely download it. Um, start putting into effect in 2019, all these little things to start letting yourself shine and start being seen more. Um, and I know all of us are rooting for you and cheering to see what all of us are doing as we grow our audiences and grow our business with us. Um, so Tara, how do people find you? I know people want to connect with you and are going to want to follow you or stalk you or whatever we <laughs> call it these days. Where do you spend most of your time? Most of my time is on Facebook or LinkedIn at Tara Ray Bradford for both platforms. Okay, perfect. And I will have those linked below as well. well. I appreciate you so much for coming on and sharing some of these tips with us. I know PR is something that my clients have struggled with. And I think a lot of women are just fearful for being seen. So I think it's such a vital piece that we add to our marketing strategy for 2019. And as we continue to grow our businesses. So thank you so much for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure to be here.